This is a presentation on qualitative research, which is quite different from quantitative research. And it, um, it's something which is not always easy to get published. Um, and I'll explain why uh, soon, but it's, it's, it's very, to me, it's a very important part of research and we learn a lot from good parts of research. Next slide. Qualitative research was once frowned upon and often difficult to get published. It was not seen as scientifically rigorous. And I certainly experienced this myself in the early days when I was a, a young psychologist working in addiction, trying to get stuff published on qualitative work was, you know, even back in the eighties and nineties was very hard, nineties, very hard. Um, many journals wouldn't publish qualitative research. Some of them still do not know have the, or have the reviewers to referee it. And, that, and that's one of the problems because unless uh, the reviewer understands the processes, then you're not gonna get a good review for your work. It's now much more acceptable and provides a valuable insight into our subject. Um, if you think about one of the things about um, addiction is it's a, it's a fairly, quite often it's a fairly secret thing in the sense that um, people um, do things secretly and therefore good qualitative research starts to actually understand why people behave in certain ways and I'll go into that a bit more. Next slide. Once it became acceptable, question of whether you use qualitative or quantitative methods. And back in those days, it was not acceptable to use both. So you either did one or the other. It's not much more common to use mixed methods, especially in dissertations. And you can use quantitative methods to examine the prevalence of a problem and qualitative methods to look at the lived experience of it. And I give you an example of my, um, I did a doctoral dissertation about 25 years ago, and it was on something called needle fixation, which is about people who inject compulsively, whether they have a drug or not. And we could measure it quantitatively by, by doing a survey, but until we actually sat down and talked to people who had the problem uh, using qualitative methods, we didn't really understand why they did it and, and some of the experiences behind it. So. It gives you a much richer experience if you have good qualitative research. Next slide. In quant quantita quantitative research, the observations usually, usually follow a syst systematic scheme whereby the classification of the data is already determined where the data collection starts. So you have a, a you know what you're doing, you know what the, the scheme is, you know how data will be classified. Um, and that's all, all determined before you even start when, you, when you've designed the research. It makes it possible to gather large data sets for numerical analyses. But understanding the data um, will be restricted by the concepts on which the collection of data was based. So if you have a huge data set, you can only really understand it uh, on the basis of how it was collected right at the start. Next slide. In qualitative research, the observations, behavior, etc., are usually fewer, and the researchers' preconceptions of the data or phenomena do not determine the research results to the same extent as in quantitative research. So in qualitative research, you don't you quite often don't know perhaps um, what you're going to find, and you don't you don't always start out with a hypothesis that this is better than that, or this is bigger than that, or whatever. It's it's much more about exploring what you find. Qualitative research is often used to study social processes or the reasons behind human behavior, i.e. The, what, the why and how of social behavior matters more than the what, where and when of quantitative research. Next slide. Qualitative addiction research focuses on topics that range from historical processes to treatment outcomes and drug use phenomena, and increasingly to answer questions about alcohol and drug policy, rapid assessments of policy developments and program implementations. And one of the things that you, if you think about, certainly drug policy, policies about drugs and alcohol in the past have often been based on um, the conceptions of the people or perceptions of the people that were 
designing the policies and they didn't, know, didn't take into account the people to whom the policies applied. I think we know far more now about why people use drugs, but we still don't know. Perhaps new drugs come along all the time and we need to know about these as we develop um, our science. Ethnographers have used qualitative methods to understand the patterns of substance use in various population groups. And it's interesting that as a um, one of the big debates raging in with our organization now is about um, getting papers published from um, lower and middle income countries about certain substances which aren't common. And I give an example of the, the betel nut, which is, or the, the, the areca nut, which is um, probably the fourth most widely used drug in the world, but we don't see it at all in, in the West. It's nearly all uh, in, in Asia. Um, but I've recently I've had two papers submitted to me about it and it's fascinating and it is it is because it is um, a drug which does have certain dangers associated with it. It needs to be publicized, but a lot of um, that needs to be done through qualitative research to really understand it. Okay, next slide. The process of processes of classification, deduction and interpretation fundamentally similar for both quantitative and qualitative research methods. Quantitative an analyzing methods are much more clear cut than qualitative methods and various steps can be more clearly distinguished in a, than in a qualitative study. So if you're doing a, um, a, a piece of quantitative research, you will, you know, when you design the research, you will already design how you're going to measure it, how you're going to analyze it, what statistical tests you're going to use, you can't always do that so well in qualitative research. In qualitative work, the collection and processing of the data are more closely intertwined, especially when the researchers personally collect the data. They will not be able to avoid problems of interpretation during the collection phase. So if you are, you know, collecting data and you're talking to people, you will start interpreting and um, understanding it as you collect the data. Next slide, please. Another issue is that qualitative anal analysis is not restricted to an unambiguously demar demarcated data set in the same way a quantitative study is. It can be a good idea to, for researchers to keep a detailed field diary, make notes of discussions so that they may refer back to these when analyzing the data. They may also later record a detail they had not taken note of earlier. And in the analysis, this must be described in an honest and convincing way. So one of the things about qualitative research is you may, you may think that you know certain things about it, but as you start collecting data, you may find that there are things you didn't realize that you didn't understand. And, and it, it's, it's important to be flexible enough and take note of those things as you do it. Next slide. Evaluation criteria for qualitative analysis. Significance of the data set and its social or cultural place. Researchers should be prepared to argue that their data are worth analyzing. It's not easy to identify the criteria for the significance of the data, but the researchers should carefully define the social and cultural place and production conditions of the data. So what that's saying is that, that um, it's not again, not as clear cut as in quantitative research, that this data is actually very important and you need to be able to, to define and argue the, the, the case for that. When using international comparisons, it's important to exclude demographic variations as a factor causing differences, i.e. do not compare African farmers to American college professors. So that it's, it's, you have to be very careful about how you make comparisons. Next slide. Sufficiency of data and coverage of analysis. In quantitative, in quantitative research, we're able to calculate in, uh, well, that should be in quantitative research. We're able to calculate in advance the extent of the data needed to estimate the parameters accurately for the purposes of the analysis. So if you, in that first paragraph, read, read that as quantitative research. You know, if we're doing a, a quantitative research project, we know how many people we work, we calculate 
how many people we need to survey or measure their treatment or whatever before we start the research. In qualitative work, this is different as we have no method for that estimate. And usually we talk about data saturation. Data is collected, data collection is terminated when no new features are revealed. So for example, you might start doing a survey on um, uh, female substance use in a certain town or a certain community. And you'll start interviewing people and when you find that that's actually that you've got no new data people are saying the same thing it's repetitive then you reach saturation next slide only in a few special cases can you base the analysis on a handful of observations you will usually need to be certain that you cover the variations of the phenomena you are studying so it's, 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 it's very uh, easy sometimes, or people sometimes think that they, they can do um, qualitative research with a very few subjects. Um, database, data sets are always much smaller than in quantitative research, but however, you, you have to be careful that you, you've covered all the parameters that you wish to study. Do not collect too much data at a time and analyze small batches of data and add as necessary. Dividing the analysis into small parts, smaller parts helps to produce manageable results for a publishable report. Next slide. Proper coverage of the analysis means that the researchers do not base their interpretations on a few arbitrary cases, but on a careful reading of the whole material. And this, this is really important because one of the things that we find, or I find as an editor, is someone submitted a paper on using qualitative methods and they have made um, assumptions based on a very small sample, which then doesn't look as if it's good enough, it's accurate enough. Qualitative reports are often loosely impressionistic because of the excessive amount of material has made it unfeasible to analyze it carefully enough. If you think about, um, you know, you, you've um, gone and recorded 20 interviews of an hour each, it can be a huge amount of data there. Um, next slide. Transparency and repeatable, repeatability of the analysis. I mean, one of the things that um, is always true of all research, whether it's qualitative or quantitative, is that it should be transparent. The analysis should be transparent. You should say exactly what you're doing and someone else should be able to repeat the work that you've done. So transparency of the analysis means that the readers are able to follow the researcher's reasoning and that they're given the necessary information for accepting or challenging the data. Three ways of improving transparency and repeatability of qualitative analysis and the report are enumerating the data, dividing the process of interpretation into steps and making explicit the rules of decision and interpretation. Next slide. So enumerate all units on which the interpretation is based. The analytical unit must be specified in as small as possible. So this would be possibly people or um, that, that's the, the typical sort of thing in our sort of work. Process of interpretation should be done step by step so the process can be visible to the researcher and the reader. Give the reader an exact picture of both technical reasons and the chain of reason that have led to the reported results so they can follow it exactly. Next slide. Consider the, some practical advice, consider the format and structure of your article. Check with your chosen journal or follow a traditional style. Check with other similar articles. So you, one of the problems is that there is a huge number, as we said earlier, a huge number of addiction journals now. Some of them will publish quite a lot of uh, qualitative research, others not. And we need to be aware of what they will do. Um, and if you find that there are articles in a journal similar to yours, then it's worth perhaps submitting there. Um, begin with the abstract, write an abstract early in the writing process, it will help you to structure the paper. And this is one thing I always encourage, and if you're ever doing a class uh, or teaching a class face to face, it's one thing I, I do as an exercise, I get them to write an abstract, and then, then they can swap them and compare them. 
it's a, it's a very useful thing because you have to think very carefully because you have very few number of words to use. Choose a title that corresponds to the content. Present the research question reshaped into the manuscript title. Because one of the things you have to remember is that people nowadays will search databases, um, they'll always have done, but they used to be in, in book form, but they will, if they're doing some research and they want to find papers to quote, they will use, you know, it's the title of the paper that will come up. So that the title really needs to make sure that your content is, is well represented in that. State the research question early and clearly. State it early and be consistent with it and don't change it. Add to it if further, if further findings are made. Sometimes what you find is that as you do qualitative research, you find some unexpected findings. And on that basis, you may need to, as I say, add to it and make, make the research a bit wider. But don't change, don't so sort of go back and change it all back to the start. So just add to it. Um, next slide. Conduct a thorough review of earlier research. Good review of earlier research on our topic is vital if you wish for your work to be taken seriously. And one of the things you find sometimes is that people have not taken sufficient account of early research and research that is on which their work is going to be based. Because if you think about it, very, very, very few scientific research papers are completely original. They're often based on something else, someone else's theory, and we're taking something a bit further. So it's, it's very unusual that, that there is not good early research to, to investigate. Present enough information in the methods and data section. Inadequate description of methods are often the reason the papers are rejected. The method will be different from quantitative, quantitative research, but remember, it is a way a reader knows what you've done and can replicate it. And that replication is always important. Next slide. Link the results to the research question so the reader can follow the progress of the work. Give raw data quotations, but not too much. Use as illustrations. And one of the things that is, is um, good about quality qualitative research is that people put in quotations of exactly what the people they have interviewed have told them. There is sometimes a mistake that people make that make their papers far too long and they include far too many quotations. They're meant to, to illustrate rather than be the complete works. In the discussion section, restate your main findings and relate them to early research. Don't forget the limitations of your study and the implications of your research findings. Um, it, it's true that nearly always qualitative papers tend to be longer than quantitative papers, and you need to take that into account if there is a word count um, in the instructions for authors. But I always encourage people to write to me as an editor saying that we've done this piece of research. It is a bit longer than your word count, but this is the reasons and this is the subject. So it's worth following that through. It's always worth contacting an editor for information. Next slide. Mixed methods. Uh, criteria for good mixed methods articles. The study has two sizable data sets with rigorous data collection and appropriate analyses and inferences made from both parts of the study. So you have um, both the, the, the um, quantitative and the qualitative work there. And as I say, one time this would have frowned upon people, you can't do mixed ones, but I think it's actually it, it, if you have a good one, especially for something like um, a thesis, a doctoral thesis, um, you can get a good measurable data from the quantitative work and then a lot of the subjective data from the qualitative work. Article integrates both parts of the study in terms of comparing, contrasting or embedding conclusions from both quantitative and qualitative strands. The article has mixed methods components that can enrich the emerging literature on mixed methods research. And it, it is sometimes, you know, it, it takes longer to design and perhaps carry out, but it's often worth doing, I think. Uh, next slide. Ah, there we are. End of presentation. Any questions, thoughts, disagreements, arguments? Well, I really 